So I entitled this presentation, Happy, Healthy, and Wealthy. Who wants to be happy, healthy, and wealthy? Yell real loud if you do. Yeah! Okay, hey, he wants to be really happy, healthy, and wealthy. So, and I mean, seriously, is there any better profession than farming for being happy, healthy, and wealthy? <laughs> Best two out of three? <laughs> okay, so, uh, I mean, there's a lot of good things about farming and ranching. I mean, you, you get to be your own boss. You're out, you're out in nature and beautiful surroundings. I mean, this, there's a lot of good things about farming and ranching. So why are we killing ourselves? Literally killing ourselves. I got a poem I'd like to read here. I'm not much for poetry, if you didn't already know that, but this is one that, um, when I came across it, a guy from Australia wrote this. So, um, you have to understand he's speaking Australian and I'm not quite fluent in that language. His cattle didn't get a bid. They were fairly bloody poor. What was he going to do? He couldn't feed them anymore. The dams were all but dry. Hay was a hundred bucks a bale. Last month's talk of rain was just a fairy tale. His credit had run out, no chance to pay what's owed. Bad thoughts ran through his head as he drove down Gully Road. G's great-grandpa bought the place back in 1898. I'm such a useless bastard. I'll have to shut the gate. Can't support my wife and kids. Not like dad and those before. Crikey. Grandma kept it going while Pop fought in the war. With depression now as master, he abandoned what was right. There's no place in life for failures. He'd end it all to nine. There were still some things to do. He'd have to shoot the cattle first. Of all the jobs he'd ever done, that would be the worst. He'd have a shower, watch the news, then they'd all sit down for tea. Read his kids a bedtime story and watch some more TV. Kiss his wife goodnight, say he was off to shoot some ruse. Then a paddock far away, he'd blow away the blues. But he drove in the gate and stopped, as he always had. Checked the roadside mailbox. Found a letter from his dad. Now his dad was not a writer. Mom did all the cards and mail. But he knew the writing from the notebooks that he kept from cattle sales. He sensed the nature of its contents. Felt moisture in his eyes. Just the fact his dad had written was enough to make him cry. Son, I know it's bloody tough. It's a cruel and twisted game. This life upon the land when you're screaming out for rain. There's no candle in the darkness, not a single speck of light. But don't let the demon get you. You have to do what's right. I don't know what's in your head, but push the bad thoughts well away. See, you'll always have your family at the back end of the day. You have to talk to someone, and yes, I know I rarely did, but you have to think about your wife and think about your kids. I'm worried about you, son. You haven't grown for quite a while. I know the road you're on because I've walked every bloody mile. The date? December 7th, back in 1983. Behind the hit shed, I had the shotgun rested up in a tree. See, I'd borrowed way too much to buy the Johnson place. Then it didn't rain for years, and we got bombed by interest rates. The bank was at the door. I didn't think I had a choice. I was going to squeeze the trigger. That's when I heard your voice. You said, where are you, Daddy? It's time to play a game. I've got Monopoly all set up. Looks like we might get rain. It really was that close. You're the one that stopped me, son. And you're the one that taught me. There's no answer in a gun. Just remember, people love you. Good friends won't let you down. 
Look, you might have to swallow pride and take that job in town. Just till things come good, son, you've always got a choice. And when you get this letter, ring me, because I'd love to hear your voice. Well, he cried and laughed and shook his head and put the truck in gear. Shut his eyes and hugged his dad in a vision that was clear. Dropped the cattle at the yards and put the truck away. Filled the troughs the best he could. Fed his last ten bales of hay. Then he strode towards the homestead, shoulders back and held, held, head held high. He still knew the road was tough, but there was purpose in his eye. He called his wife and children who'd lived through all his pain. Hugs said more than words. He'd come back to them again. They talked of silver linings, how good times always follow bad. Then he walked towards the phone, picked it up, and rang his dad. And the wall, while the kids set up Monopoly, he hugged his wife again. Then they heard the roll of thunder, and they smelt the smell of rain. It's called Rain from Nowhere by Murray Harton, if you want to look it up. Farming is now, according to one study, the number one occupation for suicide in the United States. We're not happy. We're not healthy. We're also one of the highest risk occupations for diabetes, obesity, and other, number of other health factors, including cancer. And we're not wealthy. 2018 medium farm income negative, $1,621. We're not happy, we're not healthy, we're not wealthy. Universal desires of probably every person on earth, happy, healthy, wealthy, and we're none of them. So how do we become happier, healthier, and wealthier? Well, I was going to say, buy this book, that'll do it. But the answer actually is through regenerative agriculture. So yeah, buying this book might just help. But the system of regenerative agriculture is designed to make us happier, healthier, and wealthier. So what makes us happy? Well, if you ask, <laughs> I'm no social scientist. I'm agronomist. But social scientists tell us there are some factors that do make us happier. What are those factors? Well, one of them is meaningful work. And this is how we picture ourselves as farmers. We're, uh, we're producing food for a hungry world. Boy, that's meaningful work, isn't it? Absolutely it is. You know, we feed people. We take a lot of pride in that. We should take pride in the fact that we produce an essential of life. But can you take pride in that process if this is your field? How many of you would be proud if this was your field? Can you take pride in the process when you go to the local agriculture experiment field and they have this notice about excess nitrate in the drinking water and it has to be run through a reverse osmosis before you're allowed to drink it? That's a little frightening. How much prouder can you be of the process if you're this farmer? One of our customers down in Texas sent this photo to me. Look at this. This is what his soil looked like until a few years ago when he started down this regenerative agriculture path. This is all new topsoil right here. Isn't that exciting? Now check the, how much more nutritious will the food be produced from that field than it would have been before? And one unique aspect of agriculture is it, it's not just a job. It's not an occupation. It's a legacy. So often, you know, we have tend to have family farms, and our desire is not just to pass on a job to our kids, but a legacy to our children and grandchildren 
that will bring health and happiness and prosperity to them for generations to come. If you're going to pass your farm on down to the next generation, which of these two soils would you rather pass on? These two soils were taken about 30 miles from here across the road from each other. Can you guess which one was farmed with regenerative agriculture practices and which one wasn't? And you can take pride in the fact that the method that you're using to farm is making a happier, healthier planet. I'm going to show you my own results. Okay, I put in an irrigation system at my previous farm up in north central Kansas. Dug a trench to put in a water line, and here is as deep as I could find a root, 18 inches down. Look at this. That soil structure <laughs> looks rather like Play-Doh, and it's gray, which indicates a lack of oxygen in the soil. I'm like, oh my. The deed said I owned from here to here on this field, but it didn't specify. Now, if I expand my farm horizontally, I have to take on more debt, but I can expand my farm vertically and nobody cares. I can gain more volume of soil simply by increasing my root zone. What a deal. That's a lot better than taking out another mortgage. So here's what I did. I planted eastern gamma grass really productive forage grass. And this was on irrigated ground, by the way. And people thought I was stark raving nuts when I took corn and soybean ground out of production and planted it to eastern gamma grass and alfalfa and chicory and bird's foot trefoil and a whole bunch of wildflowers. And then I rotationally grazed it, did daily moves and when I put that in, like I said, 1.9% organic matter, 18 inch root zone. 15 years later, after my divorce, I had to sell the place. The new owner um, thought it was pretty silly to have good irrigated ground growing grass, so he disked this up and grew corn. And that enabled me to sneak out in the middle of the night one night when he wasn't looking and take a soil sample. And this is after that. Now, I dug a pit while I still owned the place. Here's the same 18 inch root depth, but roots were now going seven foot down and I had 8.7% organic matter in the surface six inches. Now, just to put this into perspective, if you were to take all the world's agricultural land and increase the organic matter two percentage points, you would take all the carbon dioxide that's curly, currently in the atmosphere out. We would have no CO2 left in the atmosphere with an increase of two percentage. And I did, in 15 years, I did three and a half times that amount increase. We can fix this planet. I've never been more optimistic about it. Okay, we have a choice. We can farm like this, or we can farm like this. Which is going to make that planet smile bigger, do you think? Okay, another factor in happiness is community. There's lots of ways to define community. Community can be, you know, the local town we live in. Uh, it can be our circle of friends and family and so forth. But basically, it's the people we surround ourselves with. In the early 70s, Earl Butts said to U.S. farmers, get big or get out. If you're a farmer, how do you get bigger? You take out your neighbors, right? What's that done to our community? 
It's destroyed it, hasn't it? The county I used to live in, in 1950, had 12 high schools. Now it has one. And they're in danger of going, dropping down to six-man football because they don't have enough kids to play eight-man football anymore. We've destroyed our rural areas. And, and it has, it, has getting bigger made us happier? Has it made us more financially stable? If you're losing money on every acre, does eight more acres help? Think maybe instead of focusing on taking out which of our neighbors we're going to take over, maybe we should focus on improving the profitability of the acres we currently have. But we have this insatiable, illogical desire to always expand instead of doing a better job on the acres we have. We're, we're just gambling with bigger stakes and higher risk. And even if we were to get rich, does it make us happier? Hey, guess who else commits suicide? And you say, well, oh, these, these guys, they, they, they're in a high pressure occupation. You know, they're really stressed. Is there any less stressful way to earn a living than having a winning lottery ticket? Well, maybe there is. Being rich doesn't necessarily make you happy. I mean, you do need, and we'll talk about this, but you do need enough money to pay your bills. Being unable to pay your bills is definitely a way of being unhappy. But, so what does regenerative agriculture offer to us in the terms of community? Well, those of you that hang out in the regen ag crowd know that events like this are a great social group. A tremendous warm crowd. That's fun to hang out with. I mean, I, I always say I love the conference, but it's the evenings after the conference or in between the days of the conference that's most important. We argue every year, should we make this a one-day event where people can just show up and then leave and you don't have to commit to two days? And I always fight that because I think the most valuable part of this conference is what goes on in the evening between the two days. That's what I live for. That's my favorite part. And I don't have to listen to some boring speaker. I'm just kidding. I can listen to all these boring people instead. So, um, And when I interviewed with Green Cover Seed, they said, why do you want to work for us? I said, because you guys know all the cool people. People like Rick Haney. <laughs> how, how cool is this? Uh, is it, who's hung out with Rick Haney before? I don't know how the guy ever got a PhD because anybody that much fun to hang out with had to spend some time in, incarcerated. <laughs> I, I did think he it was maybe in his 50s when he finally got his PhD, but, uh, but uh, here, here's Matt. Clover from last night, you know, he and his kids played. I, everywhere I go, there's somebody along the way that I can stop and visit and see what they're doing on their farm. And his farm is really cool. Uh, it's in an absolutely gorgeous area, about an hour that way. Stunningly beautiful, and he's doing some really interesting things, pastured pigs and so forth. And then meaningful relationships. Another factor in ha happiness. Um, I can tell you from experience that working 16 hours a day is not a recipe for marital happiness. I can tell you from personal experience that working 16 hours a day is not a way of forging a strong relationship with your children. There's mine. This is a much better way. This is my niece and nephew. And uh, first time they ever went fishing. I was able to be part of that. 
And of course, meaningful leisure time is a great way of forging some family bonds. And of course, financial security, freedom from anxiety. You don't need to be rich, but you don't need to be on the verge of bankruptcy either. Being able to pay your bills, meet all your financial commitments without worry. And some of the things, I'm, I'm going to focus a lot on that in the rest of this talk. Okay, and then justice and fairness. Everything we buy in farming seems to be stuff we buy from criminals. The stuff we, if you're selling meat, it seems we buy from, we sell to criminals. We sell grain to criminals. Uh, are we in a system that's fair and just in agriculture? How do we get away from this? Are there ways we can grow crops without buying fertilizer from a corrupt institution? Can we sell meat without going through Brazilian-owned criminal organization? I mean, I think there are. We'll talk about this. Well, shoot, even the marijuana business, even the, the dope growers are getting shook down. So you know it's bad then. Are we healthy? And how do we become healthy? And how does regenerative agriculture make us healthier? Okay, when I was a kid, we, we, uh, we put up hay by throwing bales. And all the farmers I know who spent, you know, fed their cows by throwing bales uh, looked like Conan the Barbarian. Now we put up hay by throwing levers and we look more like Conan and Brian. <laughs> or worse yet, you know, we're, we're just fat. Obesity in the United States. What's the general term for this region of the country right here? With all these fat states? Farm country? Is this a little alarming? So we have always looked at labor as something bad that we needed to get rid of. We need labor-saving devices. We need labor-saving, you know. No, physical labor keeps us healthy and keeps us living. And so when I say, put up some picture about running a poly reel, and people go, <gasps> They recoil in horror and say, no, no, this is a good thing. Uh, I'll talk about that in a little bit. Okay, and we, this is how we used to eat. We used to have this kitchen table, and there's garden, you know, peas from the garden. Here's some homegrown meat, and, and you know, it was prepared at home and, and fried in lard, which 30 years ago, nutritionists told us, oh, lard, that's awful, that's liquid, you know, that's distillation of Satan himself, you know, it's going to cause us to have heart attacks. And now we find out, you know what does cause us to have heart attacks? All the substitutes they sold us for lard back in the days, okay? Nowadays, we don't get our food at the kitchen table. We have this nutrition center we call Casey's. And you can find all your uh, nutritional needs at Casey's. You can, uh, there's an aisle where you can meet your minimum daily requirement for alcohol. Uh, you can meet your minimum daily requirement for caffeine and liquid sugar. And uh, your minimum daily requirement for trans fat and empty carbs. Oh, your minimum daily requirement for uh, colorful sugar. And uh, your minimum daily requirement for nicotine and when you check out. Uh, there's a place where uh, people who are really mad at b bad at math can do their gambling. And uh, you can get a, a completely balanced meal, 16 ounces, 16 ounces. Can you tell which cowboy gets his meal as at Casey's? Can you tell which cowboy won the lottery ticket? So why are farmers not wealthy? Well, obviously, we, we pay too much and get too little. Uh, if you pay high input cost and you get low returns, you're not gonna make much money. So how do we fix these? Okay, because this is what farming feels like right now. What do we spend money on? And I'll focus on crops first. Land cost, we're probably not going to 
change that until we change our mindset about our desire to take out our neighbors in order to expand our operation. How much of it is just simple, pure greed? Fertilizer, I gave a whole talk on fertilizer. Herbicide, insecticide, fungicide. Yeah, these are all things that we can greatly reduce if not eliminate. Seed, depends a lot on what kind of seed. Machinery, what do we use machinery for? Well, tillage is a big one. Let's take a look at some of these things. You know, and I, yesterday I talked about getting rid of, of uh, nitrogen fertilizer. 70 million pounds of nitrogen in the atmosphere above every acre. So why are we buying it in this form when we can grow it in this form? Uh, I showed you these yesterday, so it's kind of redundant. Um, but hairy vetch being roller crimped, so it's being killed without a herbicide. Planting in the same operation. This is pretty minimal machinery cost here. And then a perfectly clean field, no herbicide, no tillage, no fertilizer, and no weeds. What a beautiful system. And this guy is selling corn for $10 a bushel. Still clean, month later. Okay? And you can use cover crops to control weeds without herbicide. This is annual ryegrass cover crop. And you see weeds over here, absence of weeds over here. If you want to learn more about this, we got a couple uh, videos up on our YouTube channel that you can check out. Um, they're, uh, they're well worth the watch. Okay, now. Another source of anxiety in farming, of course, is the weather. You say, well, you can't control the weather. What's this guy trying to control? What's he, what do you think he's praying for? What do you pray for every summer when you're farming? Right. Okay. You know, and honestly... I wonder what God thinks of when we pray for rain. This field out in western Kansas, it rained an inch ten, ten days earlier. Where'd this water come from? Here and here. What's this water doing? It's not soaking in. It's and this is fresh planted weed. I went out and trespassed on this field, hoping the guy that owned it didn't catch me. Because I was pretty curious about this. I went out here, there's wheat planted here in powder. It's not going to sprout till the next rain. So in this very same field, there is standing water, field where it's too wet to plant, too dry to sprout, and a dust storm where I, in the background here, where I had to turn on my headlights driving down the highway. Is this a sign that maybe we're not doing things right? Here's a guy right across the highway. No-till with heavy residue. You could reach under that residue and squeeze moisture out of that soil. You know what annoys me? Well, I don't know if it annoys me. I shouldn't say that. Not my place to be annoyed. But do you think maybe God gets a little annoyed when this guy prays for rain? You think maybe he's up there and he says, why do you want rain? I just sent you one and you completely wasted it. It's like your kids asking you for money. What would you do with the last hundred bucks I gave you? Well, well. Maybe God shines favor on people. Don't pray for rain. Now, my, my son was uh, really good at track in high school. And his relay team had the number one, ran the second fastest time in history on their four by one. 
in Kansas State 1A history. And so they were really excited to go to the state track meet. Well, the very first race of the season, he pulls his hamstring and doesn't run again. And they said, well, maybe, maybe you can run at state. And he can't run at regionals. So they have him as an alternate. And I'm sitting there this whole at the state track meet, and it's just such so depressing because he's just sitting there, and he doesn't run the first day. And I, uh, I go under the bleachers, and I pray. I said, God, you know, it's right before the four by one. I said, God, can you please? take my son's pain away so he can run. I go out there, they run the four by one without him. Get fifth. Yeah, I guess that he didn't run. And uh, and they had the second fastest time in state history prior to this. It's so depressing. And then He's an alternate on the 4x4, four four, which is the very last event of the state track meet. I go under the bleachers again. I thought, you know, insanity is doing the same thing over and over again, expecting different results. Apparently, I'm not praying correctly. So this time I said, if you won't take his pain away, Give him the strength to overcome his pain. And I walk out of the bleachers, and I look across, and he's on the infield, and he gets up, takes off his sweats, and he starts warming up. I'm like, apparently I figured out the secret here. And he warms up, and he's running the second leg, and he gets off, gets the handoff, and they're like in, in fifth place. Or actually, I think they're in like ninth place or something like that. He's behind a lot of people when he gets the handoff. And he takes off like a shot and passes about five people. And then he reaches the 200 meter mark, and then he pulls up and starts hopping. Oh no. He takes about three hops. He takes off running again. And he passes everybody and gets them in first place. And they end up winning the gold medal. And he didn't walk again for a month. Don't pray for rain. Pray for the wisdom to use the rainfall God gives us. That's far more powerful power prayer. So how do we change our livestock program and make us happier, healthier, and wealthier? Well, what are we spending money on unnecessarily? What creates stress and what creates danger for us? Okay. Now, I'm going to tell you what a great cattleman I am. That is a first calf heifer. I took this picture about 20 years ago. That is her calf a few days before weaning. She's a thousand pounds. He weaned off at 920. How many of you have ever had a heifer, first calf heifer, wean over 90% of her body weight? Boy, I'm good. And in a moment, I'm going to tell you the rest of the story. That's where I need to get my clown nose and glasses. Okay. So I took beef science class in college, and they put a break even up on the board, and they said, 80% of your total cost in raising a calf to weaning is feed cost. 
And about 80% of those costs are for feed for the winter time. So what, what costs are involved in providing feed? Well, you got land, fertilizer, seed, herbs, all this stuff here. Okay, what do we use all this machinery for? Cows have four legs. Well, it's for making hay. These are all the expenses involved in making hay, plus all your cost of growing. This is the cost in converting standing feed into feed in these little circles. And then what does it cost to feed the hay itself? I had a kid tell me one time, he says, well, I can, I can feed cows for $1.50 a day. He was dry lounging cattle year round. I said, $1.50 a day, what all are you figuring that? Well, my hay and silage. I said, well, how does it get to them? Oh, I got this mixer wagon here. I said, well, what pulls the mixer wagon? Oh, one of these Ford tractors. And I uh, said, well, how does the feed get in the mixer? Oh, I got the, another Ford tractor with a grapple hook on it. And so I said, well, do you run both tractors? So, no, I hire a guy to do, run the other tractor. I said, so I calculated up. I said, okay, here's what I calculate, depreciation and interest, and then you're probably burning 20 gallons of fuel an hour between two tractors. And did you have any repairs? Yeah, we busted a cylinder. Said, uh, what are you paying the guy? Oh, you know, 15 bucks an hour. Said, uh, what do you pay yourself? Well, I don't count my own labor. I said, well, then come work for me. Uh, I'll hire you for free. And, and then you, you know, once we calculated his actual cost per day, $5.31 a day. His machinery cost to just feed the hay and the silage was twice as much as the cost of the feed itself. And that's something very few people actually calculate, is all the machinery cost involved. Why do we do this? Because our mentality is still back stuck in 1973. In 1973, um, these uh, bell bottoms were in. I guess they've come back. It took a while. But we th thought, in 1973, we thought it made complete sense to do for the cow with machinery what she can do for herself. Because in 1973, beef was 50 cents a pound. Diesel was 15 cents. Nitrogen fertilizer, seven. Big round baler was three grand. And this guy was cool. My, how things have changed. Now, beef has gone up two and a half times. It's a dollar or 225 now. How many times has diesel gone up? About 20 times. Nitrogen fertilizers, about 14 times. Big round baler, about 20 times. So the stuff we sell has gone up two and a half times, but the stuff we buy has gone up about 20 times. What do they say about doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results? We cannot afford to pour machinery into livestock anymore. Okay, so how do we use less hay? Well, let's talk about the choice of calving season. Your grazing season and reducing the cost of the hay feeding process. So I'm going to tell you the rest of the story, okay? This was, she was in a group of supposedly open heifers. The rest of my herd calved in May. So I bred them all to calve in May. I checked my cattle January 1st in the middle of a snowstorm. And this guy was one of four black dots in a snowdrift. The heifers were not all open. <laughs> Some of them were bred, and they calved January 1st. So the rest of my herd was on dry grass, corn stalks, sorghum, uh, stubble. I mean, just roughing them through. You cannot feed a lactating first calf heifer that way. So 
four of these cows got separated, managed differently, fed them alfalfa hay. When, <laughs> now, I was bragging about 920 pound weaning weight. Well, he was, he was 13 months old when he got weaned. <laughs> the rest of the herd, because he got weaned the same time as my May calving calves. And they were, you know, eight, nine months old, but they averaged eight sixteen, which is pretty doggone good. When I took these calves to sale, these four calves brought sixteen dollars a head more than my Mayborn calves. Can you buy four months of alfalfa hay for a cow for $16? <laughs> then you need to tell me where you're getting it from. Because I sure as heck didn't pay for that even 20 years ago. So let's take a look at how our calving season affects our cost. Okay, so... If you take high quality hay, and I just plugged in some prices here, you can do a, a lactating cow and calf is going to eat a lot more than a dry cow. So I just plugged in 1,000 pound cow, roughly 1,200, going to consume about 45 pounds of hay a day, 160 a ton, 8 cents a pound, 45 times 8 cents is 340, and 120 day feeding period, that's $408. What can you sell? A weaned calf for right now? How, what percent of that is eaten up by this? Quite a little chunk of change, isn't it? Oh, yeah, and, and you haven't even fed them yet. So I did, you got to haul that cow over two and a half tons of hay. So let's take a dry cow instead. So let's have a cow calving in May in the winter time that you're feeding. She's only going to eat 30 pounds a day. And you can feed her some pretty junky hay because she's not milking. So that's four cents a pound, 30 pounds, that's a dollar twenty a day. So if you're feeding the same number of days, that's $144. Or, and you're hauling less, so you don't have the machinery cost involved. That's $260 less per head. That's a lot more than the 16 extra dollars I got from Kevin four months earlier. Okay, now here's another opportunity. You know, the number one rain, uh, rule in range management is to take half, graze half, and leave half. What do you do with the half you leave going into winter? Most of the time it's nothing. Well, why not? Well, say this stuff is like 3% protein. It's useless. It's not very digestible. You know what? Kept millions of bison alive for a few centuries. Why does it not work for our cow herd? Well, because we're calving in February. You cannot sustain a milking cow on this, but with a little protein supplement, it'll sure work for a dry cow. So let's look at wintering cost if you've got dry grass plus limit fed alfalfa. Just give them just enough alfalfa to meet their protein needs. Let's say that's dairy quality alfalfa and it's 10 cents a pound. And you only have to feed it every third day. And we're limit feeding, so we're only going to give them 18 pounds of that hay every third day. Well, that's 60 cents per day on average. So that's $72 a head. That's a lot different. So if you compare these, oh, yeah. And you're only working 40 days out of that winter instead of every day. So let's compare 100 cows. Here's your lactating cow herd, 46 grand. May calving herd with low quality hay or may calving herd with dry grass little difference? Does that make an impact on your bottom line? People say, oh, well, yeah, but you're going to raise a little dinky calf when you wean. 
in October. Who says you have to wean in October? Is it easier to have green grazing? If you want to compare eight months to eight months, is it easier to have good grazing in November or in February? I can stretch grazing later easier than I can make it green up in the wintertime. So here's an opportunity. On that dry grass, you want to make it cheaper yet? Instead of hauling them alfalfa hay, here's a plot from up by Colony, native grass. We drilled winter peas in that native grass. So not only is this going to provide protein right there mixed with the grass, it also makes nitrogen. What does nitrogen do to grass growth? Makes it grow. Another problem with Kevin in the middle of winter time, I think there's a reason they didn't put me on right before lunch. When you have a calf that is stressed thermally during its first week of growth, you get problems, scours. This is a statue in Casper, Wyoming, of this heroic cowboy out in, the, out in the blizzard saving this calf. What a hero, right? Who's the guy who put that calf in that peril? The same moron who turned the bull loose two months earlier than he should have. I mean, this is not ideal calving situation. This is. When I switched my own operation from make it, when I started out calving in February, because everyone said that's when you need to calve because you want to be all done by the time you have to start farming. You know, working ground and everything, get ready to plant seed. And so I did it, and during calving, my very first calving season, I had them in a dry lot. Uh, the dry lot is not an accurate term because it rained every day, it froze every night. I lost calves from getting stomped on the feeder. I had one calf actually freeze to the ground. He froze to the ground. And I had to peel him off and half his hair came up, it was awful. I lost a third of my calf crop. I said, I don't care. I'm gonna calve in May. I don't care how small my calves are. And this, is what I had. It's like in the Wizard of Oz when it went from black and white to color. All of a sudden, calving season became changed from a chore to a joy. I mean, all you got to do is go out and say, oh, look at all the cute baby calves. Now calving season's fun. I didn't have to catch them and throw them in the truck and warm them up. I didn't have to treat scours anymore. I mean... The work went away, and it became enjoyable work. I mean, you just walk around, look at cute baby calves. What's the problem? Another way of wintering cattle is stocks, corn stocks. But even here, there's a lot of things we can do. Because how do we ordinarily use corn stocks? Well, we throw them out there on the field and forget about them for a month. Now, if there's two bushels of grain on the ground, that's 112 pounds an acre, and that's pretty low harvest loss. So if you put cattle out at a rate of one cow per acre for a month, kind of the standard rule of thumb, for four days, that cow eats nothing but grain. Then when the grain's gone, she eats nothing, stocks for another 26. 30 pounds of grain is 2% of their body weight. And grain intake over half a percent of body weight will create a condition called acidosis. This is what the inside of a rumen is supposed to look like. See all these fingers here? That's for absorbing nutrients. This is the inside of a rumen that had acidosis. This is what we do to cows on corn stalks every year. What do you think it does to their longevity? destroys it. What do you think it does to their ability to digest stalks the rest of the grazing period? Or grass when you turn them out to grass? It just ruins it. So, how do you fix that? Well, you strip graze. You start at the water source, 
you have these two poly reels set up, and then every day you just leapfrog the poly reel. You move it from here to here, and the cattle get this one extra days of feed. And you say, so what's this do? Well, now instead of eating 30 pounds of grain for four days, they eat four pounds every day and 26 pounds of stocks. And that's half of the amount to cause acidosis. So the rumens stay healthy. And research across at University of Nebraska, Purdue, uh, University of Illinois, Ohio State, every Corn Belt University corroborates this. You can double the number of cow days per acre. You can stay out on stocks. We're taking a cheap feed and making it even more economical. Okay? And all you got to do is run one of these. People say, oh my God, you don't know how busy I am. I don't have time to do that. You have time to go to the doctor? Let me show you something here. So, here's your general rule. But with strip grazing, you can carry the same number of cows twice as long. And stocks, if you're renting stocks, they're about 10 bucks an acre. If they're your own stocks, they're pretty much free. And a month of low quality hay costs about $36 a head, what we calculated earlier. So every month they're on stocks, you save $26 a head. So if you have uh, 160 cows on that quarter section, 26 times 160 is the amount you save. That's $4,160. And if it takes 15 minutes a day to move that fence, which is a lot longer, honestly, than what I've timed myself, that's $277 an hour. How many of you will do 15 minutes of exercise if you're getting paid $277 an hour. Raise your hands. Six of you. <laughs> but wait, there's more. Remember when I was talking about how we need to get more exercise? We've taken the actual physical work out of farming to our detriment. You're getting paid $277 an hour to be healthier, okay? Oh, and if you order before midnight tonight, there's more. How about we throw in some cover crops? This is aerial seeded cover crops. This is 60 inch corn rows with cover crops drilled in between when corn was like at V4 stage. What's this stuff good for? That's Bayou Kale. How about post-harvest pasture? Now what you've done here is not only have you created more feed, but you've changed corn stalks from maintenance feed to milking feed. So instead of weaning in October, you put your cows and calves out on this, and you make those cows work another couple months. And you slap another 100, 200 pounds of gain on those calves. How profitable is that? And your soil gets better every year. This was drilled in wheat stubble. This is uh, tillage radish and oats. And this carried um, four pair an acre for three weeks in the fall. And uh, those calves put on right around 75 pounds in that period. And this is some sorghum some sterile sorghum that was planted in wheat stubble, and this is being pastured in winter. The day this photo was taken, it was 20 below. Cows look pretty happy to me. And you don't have to fire up a tractor. I can't ever start a tractor on a cold morning anyhow. I showed you about fescue, and stockpiled fescue is the best January, February grazing there is. But the problem is, you can't you can't graze in February what you already grazed in August. 
You have to stockpile it. You have to find something else to graze in the fall. What can you graze in the fall instead of that fescue? How about some of these things? Okay, and this is just showing how good that fescue is in the wintertime. It's better than most of the hay we feed cows. So, now, um, another thing that all these grazing ways of extending the grazing season can make your life better, not only do you feed less hay, you can do something called delayed weaning. Now, the university talks about early weaning all the time. You, know, you wean at three months. You just feed the calf directly. I'm like, why? We've got a perfect system. The cow eats grass and then feeds the calf. And they said, no, wean early and feed the calf grain. Are you nuts? Why do we let that cow slide by only working three months out of the year? Why do we let them by only working seven months out of the year? She's happy to do the work. Why do we wean at seven months? Well, usually because that's when the pasture season runs out. And you don't want, you have to feed a lactating cow, but if you can provide quality groceries to that cow for eight months, nine months, ten months, the same amount of feed that'll put a pound and a half on a calf, if you run it through the cow and let her supplement that calf with milk, will do three pounds a gain a day. Why not capture the magic milk? As long as you can provide quality feed, you can do delayed weaning. What's the advantage of delayed weaning? When your 18-year-old leaves the house to go to college, mama cries. There goes my baby. When your 30-year-old leaves the house, mama throws a party. <laughs> Finally, that's the difference in delayed weaning. You take something that's very stressful on the calf, on the mother, and on the caretaker, and you turn it into really almost a pleasant situation. The, the cow almost weans the calf by herself. It's so much better, and they don't get sick. Okay, here's a way of making hay feeding better. Spaced bale feeding, bale grazing. You put those bales out on a grid, and then you just move this electric fence every day, your poly wire, and you have these lightweight, you know, polyethylene bale rings. And you only need hay moving equipment one day, the day you put all these bales out on the grid. If, that's, if you only need equipment one day out of the year, do you have to own it? Absolutely not. And I showed you these numbers yesterday. This, um, this is the English units. I showed you the metric yes, yesterday. But look at this, your control. This is hay feeding method. Here's feeding the hay in a lot and spreading it. And this is feeding directly out on the pasture. All those nutrients go back out on that pasture to improve productivity. Now, I talked about the take half, leave half deal. Once you graze more than half of the leaf area on grass, it starts killing the roots. This is brome. This black line is smooth brome, common grass, eastern Kansas, Nebraska. Uh, this is grazed to a three inch double height. Here's at a six inch double height. Can you name me any other thing that'll double your productivity without writing a check? And you say, well, that looks good, but the cows don't follow the system. What's your grazing height on this? Cows didn't get the memo. You're supposed to bite every single grass right here. You're not supposed to take 90% of this, none of this but they keep coming back to this grass because it's got tender regrowth throughout the season. You look from the road, it looks like this pasture's fine, but you get out in here, look at this, this is grazed 90%. What's that do to your root growth? Kills it. Next year, how productive will this plant be? Did this plant this year, did it contribute at all to your financial status? None. How do you fix this? Your rotational graze. Now this is simple rotation. 
You graze a week here, week here, week here, week here. So when you get back to here, how many days of rest has this pastor had when you get back to it? 21? Here's daily moves. You graze a, a day here. You, you still graze seven days here, but they only get one day's worth at a time. So when you get back to here, now how many days of rest have you had? Calculate it. You get 27. 27 days because you're still carrying them 28 days. But now this little strip here, when it gets back, has had 27 days of rest instead of 21. Is there any increase in growth between 21 and 27 days? Anybody bail alfalfa? Basically doubles in yield from 21 days of rest to 27, doesn't it? This is the magic of rotational grazing. Here's something else magical. If this is your pasture, what are you going to do? If you're renting this pasture, what's the landlord tell you to do? That's a mess. Get rid of that stuff. Call a plane. Get the tort on out. Why do you want rid of this stuff? The cows won't eat that. Yeah, they will. If you're daily movement grazing. See the wire? Polywire. This is Brett Peshek's pasture down in Oklahoma. And that picture that I just showed you actually is just a close-up right here. <laughs> they will eat that stuff. When you move that fence every day, it changes the cattle mentality. The best analogy, I don't know why, but the best analogy I've heard is that if you walk into the Pizza Hut buffet and you're the only person in the place, you're going to walk up that buffet and you're going to look around and you're going to walk around the twice and pick out the, the very best thing. If, however, you're walking up to that, you hear a screech of brakes, you look out, and it's a school bus carrying the high school football team, and they start unloading, you're going to grab whatever the heck you can while you can. When you bunch cattle up, they become very competitive for feed, and they eat everything. And it's not because they're being starved to death. Because I've done this, and... The first thing they'll eat, a lot of times, is this brush that they don't touch under continuous grazing. Now, we also know that nitrogen makes grass grow. Here's 0, 100, 200, 300. Obviously, you get a lot of grass when you apply a lot of nitrogen. Only problem with that is you've got to write a check for the nitrogen. Or you can grow it, and I showed you some of these figures yesterday as well. Look at that. When you add legumes, it's just as good or better than adding nitrogen. Plus, you get more protein. Plus, you get better animal performance because this is a toxic grass. And these, especially this, neutralize that toxicity. Now, look at that. Also, it's pretty, isn't it? You get a pasture full of flowers. Is there a species of livestock that can take flowers and change them into money? How about these? If you're rotationally grazing with legumes, you will have sequence of bloom throughout the entire summer that you can monetize. My daughter makes lip balm on a big scale out of beeswax. She's monetized basically monetized pasture flowers. Okay, another income stream you can generate from pasture and a means of increasing pasture productivity is by putting monogastrics out there. You got some pastured pigs here, uh, pastured poultry. Why does this increase pasture productivity? Well, I thought hogs tore up pastures. Well, if you leave them in one space, one place the whole season, they definitely will. But what if you move them around? Then they do this. Look at this soil. This is across the fence. 
when you run all that feed that you import through that animal, change it into manure and worms and soil biology, work it over, this is the kind of soil you can get. That will grow some serious grass. Another way increasing pasture productivity and reducing your stress is to understand how grass grows. This is tall fescue. This is Bermuda grass. Cool season grass, warm season grass. They're different. Obviously this fescue in April, I took this photo April 7th. This is a superior grass to this then. Now, this is fescue in July. See how nice and green it is right here? Almost dead. This is warm season grass, eastern gamma grass. I took that fescue picture right over here. Cool season, warm season. They're different. They each have strengths and weaknesses, and when you can make a, a system where you incorporate both of them, this is cool season grass grazed in the summer. It does nothing. It's got fall in the blue, summer in the yellow, spring here. So these were herds all grazed on fescue in the spring, some left on fescue, others put on warm season grass, and then fescue in the fall. Look at how much more gain you get when you move them to a seasonally appropriate grass. So this is how ranchers now spend their time and money, all spring calving, all summer baling hay, all fall treating sick calves after winning, and all winter feeding hay. Well, if you do all the things I talk about, here's how you spend all your time. Building meaningful relationships and meaningful leisure time. So how does regenerative of agriculture build local communities? Well, what does your community produce that gets sold outside the community? If you're in most of rural America, beans, wheat, corn, cattle. Okay? What does your community buy that is produced outside the community? Everything that you buy in here, where's this stuff produced? China? Yeah, that's good for our rural economy, isn't it? Is there anybody here that thinks a new Walmart in town is actual rural development? I hope not. What does your community produce that is consumed within your community? I can hear the crickets chirping. Think about it. What does your community produce that's consumed within your community? Can you think of much of anything? Here's what we sell. Number two yellow corn, 10 cents a pound. Here's what we buy down at Walmart or Dollar General. $4.33 a pound. Is there a little markup? Where's the money go? Here's what we sell. Fat cattle for $1.25 a pound. Here's what we buy. The cheapest cut of beef, $5.49 a pound. Where's the money go? So why don't we grow and sell real food and consume that same real food locally? So here's an example. Wheat, seven sixty a bushel, which is one heck of a price, by the way, 12 cents a pound. You can mill that wheat and sell this, $1.29 a pound. Ten times the price, folks. And all you got to do is mill it. Or you can mill it, then bake it. What if you have a bakery? Now, you're at 30 times the price. Little difference? Where's the money go? And then we've got, can we do this? So, well, I don't want to bake bread in my kitchen table. You don't. You don't. What you do is just like we did with the East Kansas Energy up in Garnett, we put together a cooperative of farmers to market our own products and turn them into money. There's a reason there's a rainbow here. After we did this, what happened to the price of corn in 2006? 
skyrocketed. Okay? We don't have to just raise commodities. Here's natural grocers. This daikon radish we sell, $1.99 a pound. You say, well, we can only grow that in the summer. No, we don't, we're not limited to summer. We can grow year-round. Sunken greenhouse. I want to show you something here. Allen Nation, Stockman Grass Farmer, said we need to find our competitive advantage. And someone asked him, well, where's the best place in the country to raise grass-finished beef? He said, well, first of all, you got to take this out because it's too cold and you got to feed too much hay. And here it's too hot. Cattle don't gain in the summertime. And over here it's too dry. It takes too many acres to carry it. He said, over here it's too wet. you got to fight mud. Well, that's not much of the country left. He said, oh, yeah, you got to take this out because up here you got to compete against subsidized corn. The ground's too expensive. That leaves you here, and we are located here. This is the absolute easiest place in the United States to raise grass-finished beef. You know what? Because we can do it year-round. We can grow cool season grasses, warm season grasses, grazed cover crops, and do it cheaper here than anywhere else in the country. And if this is up at Garnett, this is Bauman's Mobile Meat. Um, if we process it locally, we could be selling this instead of beef at a buck twenty-five. And so now our rural communities can have a butcher, a baker a candlestick maker, a tannery, furniture making out of that leather, hey, grass-finished dog food. We can sell it locally. Let's take out Dollar General and Walmart and actually have our own grocery stores that are not farmer's markets. It's open one day a week, but stuff open and sells where people actually buy groceries on a routine basis. And these places become not just grocery stores, but like the Mildred store, a community center. Who's been to the Mildred store? If you're heading north, you got to check it out. It's a neat place. So in, we've had centuries of urbanization. What we need is ruralization. And here's what happens, and this is why it's so important. Has anybody seen the movie Apollo 13? Here's my final thought here. Apollo 13, Houston, we have a problem. You know, they have this disaster in space, and they can't land on, not only can they not land on the moon, but they only have half the oxygen they need to get back to Earth. They're facing almost 100% certainty of suffocation before they get back, and they're in a vehicle not designed for re-entry. And there's a scene where they, they put all the stuff out on the table. This is what's in the landing module. I said, you guys figure out a way to bring them back safely using what's in that landing module. I thought, you know, this is like every Sunday afternoon on the farm because the planter broke down you can't get parts till tomorrow, and it's supposed to rain tonight. And I bet those guys grew up on a farm. And I heard an interview by Jim Lovell when he was speaking at the Cosmosphere in Hutchinson. He said he owes his life to the fact that every single person in the command center, all 26, grew up on a farm and were able to figure out with duct tape and bailing wire how to bring them back alive. At that time, in that era, 5% of the U.S. population grew up on a farm. The odds that that's a random occurrence that every single one is 0.05 to the 26th power. I don't even know if there's a word for a number that big. It's one over that number that that's a random occurrence. The greatest product we ever produced on our farms was not corn, wheat, beans, or cattle. It was our children. 
And we have eliminated generation after generation of our best product through this desire to get big that's destroying our communities. Let's figure out a way to keep more money back on our rural farms and communities. Thank you.